Hi, my name is Deborah Hurd. I'm an archaeologist. In addition to being an archaeologist, I'm also an Egyptologist and a Nubiologist. What does that mean? Well, that means that I also study the ancient societies of Egypt and Nubia. We also refer to the region as the Nile Valley. So you can say that I'm archaeologist of Nile River Valley civilizations. My name is Shayla Monroe. I am an archaeologist, but I am a special type of archaeologist. I'm called a zooarchaeologist, and I study the relationship between people and animals in the past. And if you'd like to learn more about what zooarchaeologists do, please watch the film Meet a Zooarchaeologist. Hi, my name is Janelle Marshall, and I'm a bioarchaeologist that works in Sudan. Bioarchaeology is the study of human skeletal remains, and we study this to help us understand how people lived in the past and how they interacted with their environment. I'm Solange Ashby. I am an Egyptologist, although I specialize in ancient Nubia. Ancient Nubia has an amazing 3,000 year history that runs in parallel with that of Egypt to its north. The initial populations in the Nile Valley consisted of A-group Nubians to the north and the pre-Kerma people who lived at the site of Kerma at the Third Cataract. Following the pre-Kerma period, the Kerman civilization comes into being around 2600 BC and lasts for an astounding 1000 years. Uh, but their kings were very powerful and buried under huge mound burials. The next Nubian kingdom was that of Napata. From about 900 BC until about 300 BC, you may have heard of these Kushite kings that formed the 25th dynasty in Egypt, famous pharaohs like Pianki and Taharqa. The final Nubian kingdom runs from about 300 BC until about 300 AD, and that's the kingdom of Meroe, where we have amazing um, gold riches, jewelry, pyramid burials, um, and uh, very powerful ruling queens. But before we get too deep into each of these individual kingdoms, let's take it back, 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 and start at the beginning of Nubian history. So we've gone back almost 12,000 years. Why? Because 11,700 years ago, the climate was not exactly the same as it is now. So what was happening? Well, around 12,000 years ago, the Pleistocene ended. What's the Pleistocene, you might ask? Well, that was the last ice age. And from there, we moved into the period called the Holocene. The Holocene is the time period in which we currently live. But what was going on during that transition between the Pleistocene and the Holocene? Well, the glaciers began to melt. And as the glaciers melted, that meant an increase in water, in the oceans, and in seas which also meant rain began to fall again. Grasslands began to grow, starting from the south at the equator where the rain belts had been and moving north progressively, going towards what we now know as the Sahara Desert. So between 9,000 and 7,000 years ago, instead of it being a barren wasteland, the desert was actually green and lush, which meant there were animals there were lakes, there were rivers. And as the animals migrated to the north, so did people. As these people were coming together, then you have different groups of people that are mixing and mingling with each other. But over time, because the good times can't last forever, about 6,000 years ago, the area began to dry out again the deserts began to return. And over the next 2,000 years, we see a massive return of desertification throughout that region that have previously been the grasslands of Northeast Africa. So what does that mean for the people? 
Well, the people had been migrating in search of food. So people had been migrating from south to north. People had also been migrating east and west. As the land became drier and drier, people started to seek out more permanent water sources. And one of those water sources was the Nile River. The Nile River is composed of three branches. The White Nile, which flows from Uganda, from Lake Victoria. The Blue Nile, which flows from Lake Tana in Ethiopia. And the Adbara River, which flows from the Takazi River, also in Ethiopia. Now these three branches came together during that phase of the Green Sahara that we just talked about, inside of what we currently now know as Sudan. And from there, it flows all the way out to the Mediterranean. The Nile River is the world's longest river at well over 4,000 miles. It is one of the only rivers in the world to flow from south to north. The interesting thing about that is that during one of those really early geological periods, the earth shifted so much, the plates the rifting and the shifting, that the area around Ethiopia and Kenya are elevated in relationship to the areas around Sudan and Egypt. So water flows from the highlands of Ethiopia and Uganda all the way down to the Nile River Valley. The people of the Nile Valley actually oriented themselves to its flow. So for them, south was up and north was down. So Upper Nubia was the southern portion of Nubia and Lower Nubia was the northern part. Another way that we can classify the, ge the geography of ancient Nubia is by the river itself. Within the river, there are a group of rock outcrops that we call cataracts. There are six of these major cataracts in the Nile River between Khartoum and Aswan. They're numbered one through six, with six being the southernmost, right below Khartoum, and the northernmost being at Aswan, which was the ancient boundary between Nubia and Upper Egypt. The traditional landscape of Nubia had a profound impact on the religious beliefs of the people. For example, the wide open desert spaces, the life-giving Nile River that flowed through the land, each generated various gods and goddesses worshipped by the Nubian people. The river itself was considered sacred, with water spirits inhabiting the river. The natural plateau of Jebel Barkal at the Fourth Cataract has long been held by the local people to be a sacred site dedicated to the worship of the god Amun. This god Amun was uh, assimilated then to a local ram god who had traditionally been worshipped in Nubia as early as the Kerma period. They shared many gods with the ancient Egyptians, the cow-headed Goddesses Hathor and Isis, for example, originate in Egypt, but were probably assimilated to a local Nubian cow goddesses. The hawk-headed god Horus was very prominent in Nubian religion, although adopted from their Egyptian neighbors to the north. Nubians watched and studied the night sky. Their astronomical skill is attested from prehistory to the latest periods of the Kingdom of Meroe. At Nab to Playa, a prehistoric site in the Nubian desert, calendar circles made of large stones are aligned with the rising of the star Sirius, which coincided with the onset of seasonal rains that brought life to the Green Sahara. We tend to describe the people who were moving in and out of the Nile Valley at this time as the primary pastoral community. These people were more dependent on cattle and starting to 
build their lives and their ideology around the presence of cattle. They also used certain markers to identify themselves as cattle people, so to speak. So when we look at their makeup, they have more colors in their makeup than people who aren't taking care of cattle. They have evidence of piercings that might have been rubbed against the bottom of their skull. We can see that when we look at their bodies. They have larger earrings made out of more colorful material. And the combs, we see lots of really cool combs that look a little bit like Afro picks and they've got little animals carved on them. So we know that people are paying a lot more attention to their hair and their hairstyles. They're coming into the Nile Valley with this full pastoralist drip and they're stunting on everybody because they're the cattle people and they dress and they look and they act like they're celebrating cattle all the time. The celebration of cattle didn't stop in life. We also see it carried over in death through Nubian burial customs. One of the most common burial practices that we see throughout Nubia is burying their loved ones with Bucrania. And Bucrania are male cattle um, with the horns and the skull, and they were often painted and had geometric patterns on it, really beautiful features. Cattle herding was a very important feature of Nubian society. And so it makes sense that we see this carried out even in the afterlife. The early graves in Nubia consisted of earthen mounds that we refer to as tumuli. And they're usually constructed with a pit and a chamber. Typically, local leaders were buried in tumuli. Um, and they were placed on leather blankets and typically covered with leather blankets. We find that they typically laid the body of the deceased on its side. This is something that bioarchaeologists call a flex position. You can think of it as similar to a fetal position where they lay on their side with their knees crouched and it looks like they're sleepy. The grave goods consisted of many things like ostrich feathers, jewelry, amulets, sandals, and even daggers. Other ways that Nubians express their cultural traditions include tattooing, for example. In the earlier periods, we see primarily Nubian women sporting diamond-shaped tattoos around their waist or on their upper shoulders. Um, they wore cowrie shell belts as part of their attire that really closely matches that of priestesses of Hathor. So when we talk about Nubian states, the one that we know of by name is Kush. When we first see Kush appear in any records, it is during Egypt's sixth dynasty. So an official talks about going to Kush to recruit mercenaries or soldiers to fight in the Egyptian army. Kush at that point was in upper Nubia around the third cataract at a place called Kerma. Kerma reached its height during Egypt's middle kingdom, moving from settlements of groups of people moving into the area and becoming a centralized chiefdom and then eventually a state during Egypt's middle kingdom period. The early economy of Kerma was built on a combination of intensified agriculture and animal pastoralism. When Egypt starts to build its wealth by trading uh, products throughout the Mediterranean, Kerma builds a simultaneous wealth as an intermediary. So even though Egypt was moving a lot of these African products like exotic animals, gold, gemstone, etc., out of the African continent into the Mediterranean, part of the way that Kerma built its wealth during the Kerma Classic period was pulling all of those products through their trade networks out of the central part of the African continent, up the Nile Valley, down the river, towards Egypt. During the height of the Kermit Kingdom, we begin to see the material items and customs grow bigger and larger and more elaborate. 
and we begin to see more marked differences in how the local leaders are buried. And some of the tumuli are up to 90 meters in diameter. So think of a giant Ferris wheel. These are huge burials for local leaders. Um, they are decorated with these black and white stones uh, during this time as well. Um, and you gotta think, this is the desert, and so black and white stones really stand out to also show just how important this person was. We see individuals laid on cow hides, and these cow hides are laid on top of beds. Burial beds are one of the most important features of Nubian culture. The burial bed legs were often shaped like cows, again, tying back to the cattle culture that they have, and they were often wrapped in gold foil. The head and the footboards often had decorations made of ivory and they depicted geometric patterns, plants, animals that must have been in that area during the time, such as lions, hyenas, elephants. And some of my favorite depictions are of the imaginary creatures like the flying giraffes. The use of beds is an enduring cultural trait in Nubia and we find evidence of their use well into the later Meroitic period and even today sometimes. Another enduring feature of Nubian culture that we see during the Kerma period is still the use of Bucrania, but large amounts of it. And one of the local leaders' tombs, we found 5,000 Bucrania. That is a lot of bull heads. Can you imagine the little horn sticking out <laughs> of the ground and you've seen 5,000? That is a lot. And that also symbolizes just how wealthy that ruler was during their reign. Kerma reached its height during Egypt's Middle Kingdom to the point where it actually became a threat to Egypt, Egyptian sovereignty. During Egypt's Second Intermediate Period, Egypt was plagued with a dynasty to its north called the Hyksos, who were a foreign people, and the Nubians to the south, mainly the people at Kerma. The Egyptian king was fearful that the Nubians would make an alliance with the Hyksos and divide up Egypt between the two of them. He actually caught a messenger on the road from Lower Egypt trying to get to Kerma to ask for assistance in defeating the Egyptian king. At the end of the 17th dynasty, an Egyptian king arose that was able to finally defeat the Hyksos and run them out of Egypt and regain control of Lower Egypt. After defeating the Hyksos and running them out of Egypt, the king, Akhmosa, turned his sights on Kerma. From there, a succession of at least four pharaohs waged war against Kush until finally reaching defeat under the reign of Hatshepsut and Thutmose III. At that point, an independent state of Kush no longer existed at Kerma, but became a colony of the Egyptian state. So Kerma was a colony of the Egyptian state for about 450 years. That wasn't just a willing colonization, though there were times when the Kushites in Kerma rebelled against the Egyptians. The downfall of the Egyptian state into another intermediate period that resulted in the final ending of colonialism in Kerma. 